Hi, can you hear me? You can, okay, great, Hi, thank you. Hi, John, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, let me, John, I'm gonna make you a co-host so you can share your stuff, hang on. All right. Video and I say foolishly yes, it's pretty shocking. <laughs> Put it by your head. <laughs> no. And and John, I love your background. <laughs> it's a great background. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I figured I figured I'd channel Carl Sagan tonight. You've done a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I expected you to be in a spacesuit, though, so you disappointed me. <laughs> so, so okay, so okay, so okay. I, let me show you what I did prepare. Wait, uh, <laughs> I can, you know, I'm gonna take this off my video. Where's it? Video. <laughs> Daniel Bumper. Huh. That's a nice spaceship you're in. Oh. Okay, so 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 in the background now, listen to this. If you can hear it, I have a Starship okay. Enterprise. I, I did this for Allison as a former. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that anyway. It's going to be Star Trek. Uh, yeah, we heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh. um. I think we Daniel Glover is here, so we can start the party, right? Hi, Daniel. How are you? Good to see you. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, everyone. Again, we are in our sixth week of 2020 Great Decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, as you all know, it's been a great series so far. We've gone all the way around the world. Uh, we've done demography, industrial policy, and now we are heading into the final frontier um, we're really lucky to have with us tonight John Dowdy. Um, mm -hmm. John Dowdy is a longtime supporter and member of the World Affairs Council of Maine, <laughs> on the board, the president <laughs> committee, um, and he, in his real life, is the chief investment officer for RM Davis, and he really specializes in global risk assessment and the sort of the intersection of economics and politics, which I think is why he finds foreign policy so interesting. And he has graciously agreed to take on this topic, uh, which is one that is near and dear to his heart. And as I understand, because I got a preview of this um, when we were over at the Osher Institute, um, because of a real affinity for Elon Musk, right, John? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but with all my giggling and snarkiness aside, um, this is a really fascinating topic and um, something that I think really shows the extent to which we need to reconsider what foreign policy means and really underscores the challenges facing our decision makers because this is a frontier that defies and challenges so many of the basic assumptions about how we regulate our international relations. Um, and so I really, John, I really appreciate all the uh, work that you've done uh, in terms of bringing this critical topic to us. So I'm gonna hand things over to you. Um, as always, we'll hear from John, try to use your virtual hand signal if you have a question. And we will be hard on ideas and soft on people when we get to our conversations. So thank you. John, over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I, I think many of you have seen me present before. So I've got a lot of slides here. Now I will try to fly through a lot of these, but I think it's kind of instructive because a lot of us don't know about space. We don't know about the economics of space. We don't know about the technological changes that have happened over the past 20 years or so. Um, and, and frankly, you know, the United States primacy in space is being challenged now by China. Hmm. So while everyone's focused on Ukraine and Russia, China at the end of the day is challenging the US not only on earth, but in space. And so we'll kind of take off, 
Let's see, we'll launch. So, you know, I always admired Elon Musk for what he has done with um, electric vehicles, with manufacturing, but I got a new newfound appreciation after putting dozens of hours into this and watching um, so many hours of, uh, of his space, space, uh, space stuff. Uh, anyway, he is really driving uh, space right now. This is an image of um, the Starship spacecraft, which um, SpaceX is working on. Uh, this is looking like it's going to be the future of space travel and exploration. But if we step back, uh, you know, visionaries, at least in the United States, Robert Goddard was the father of modern rocketry. And then you had some science fiction writers. The big three are known as Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, Arthur Clarke, who really challenged our imaginations. Now, certainly there was Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and others, but these three folks are really kind of uh, have the spotlight on them for really challenging um, our imaginations and, 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 and what uh, space might look like. And I think if, if one president is to be put on a pedestal in terms of really vaulting us into space, John F. Kennedy challenged the nation uh, to take on the, Russian, the Russians in space. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And now I would also really put Elon Musk on a pedestal as well for leading this new space renaissance. And, and as I've said in some other presentations, you kind of have to ignore his tweets. You have to ignore what he's doing with Twitter. You have to ignore some of that. And we're kind of just like focusing on what he's doing with SpaceX, really. So when we look at the first space race, now, in, in some respects, it started in World War II, I guess you could argue, with, with the V-2 rocket and the Germans, with von Braun and, and, and you know, just dozens of, like, very, very intelligent folks that, you know, put um, rockets into... Uh, you know, high altitudes and, and could target uh, things at distances. But we'll start out with the primary space race, which was when the Russians or the Soviets really put a, um, the Sputnik satellite into orbit in 1957. And then by 1961, they put uh, the first human in space. That took the United States by surprise. Uh, we were used to being number one after World War II. Um, and this, this set out a challenge. Uh, in 1958, President Eisenhower formed um, uh, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which would really start to focus on space and the, and the challenge posed by the Soviets. But I think it was this speech in 1962 by uh, President Kennedy at Rice University, where he really challenged the nation uh, to meet uh, you know, the Soviets uh, in space. Um, we don't like being number two. Uh, and, I, and I think this really pushed, pushed the nation. Now, a lot of money went into this program. There were three primary parts to the space race with the uh, Soviets. The first was Project Mercury. <coughs> the objective of Project Mercury, briefly, was to get a spacecraft in space. That was followed by Project Gemini which was to actually get a human in space and to get what's called an EVA or extravehicular capability. In other words, you open up the space capsule and the, and the astronaut is actually in space. So all these were first steps to the ultimate objective, which was to uh, the Apollo program to uh, send humans to the moon, land them on the moon and then return them to Earth safely. So that was all accomplished really in um, uh, less than 10 years. By 1969, mm -hmm. uh, Americans had landed uh, on the moon. So we had won in effect the space race. Now, during this time, certainly there was, you know, the challenge of the Soviets uh, in, in terms of the Cold War with the United States was, was you know, going on on earth, obviously. Um, uh, you know, we had proxy wars with the, with the Soviets. And, uh, but in 1975, I think um, scientists tried to bring us together in terms of the Apollo-Soyuz program, uh, whereby 
you know, the, the US and the Soviets utilize different technologies in their, in their spacecraft. So there's different oxygen and nitrogen content in the US spacecraft versus the Soyuz capsules. So in order to actually do this, there had to be a lot of communication and collaboration. Um, so despite this, you know, pretty scary Cold War at times here on Earth, you know, we were working with the Soviets in space and our scientists were collaborating. Much of, much of the space program that many of us are really familiar with is the space shuttle. And this is a photo of uh, the interior of the space shuttle. What's fascinating about the space shuttle was that there are over 1,000 uh, switches and buttons in this space capsule. 1,000. Here is Elon Musk's Dragon crew capsule today. Uh, much of it is um, touchscreen. Uh, so certainly uh, we don't attribute all this to Elon Musk, but a lot of this is technology that has come, up, come along over the, over the decade or so uh, post the uh, space shuttle. One thing I find fascinating, uh, and at least I, I learned this from this from doing this, uh, setting this presentation up, was there's no there's no um, uh, agreed uh, area where space begins. So, for example, um, some international organizations believe that space begins at 62 miles above Earth. Uh, U.S. military believes it begins around 50 miles above Earth. So it's arguably easier to become an astronaut in the US if you're in the United States uh, than if you are, say, in an international space program. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because there are civil aviation conventions such that um, if, you, if you have, like, for example, Maine, and you know a Soviet aircraft can't fly uh, without uh, proper authorization, say, you know, 30 miles above uh, the state of Maine or the United States, the continental United States. Um, but they can fly above 50 miles above in, in space. So, um, you know, it has legal, legal implications. Now, most of the world has signed the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. This has been augmented by the Moon Treaty as well. So there is, there is definitive space law. Um, and, and the important thing about this is uh, the, the signatories of this have agreed to utilize space as, as for peaceful purposes. But, I think that's beginning to change. Um, I, one thing to consider here is if you look on, this, uh, on, on the picture on the, on the left, the Saturn V rocket, it takes a tremendous amount of energy in order to get a spacecraft off planet Earth and into space. Juxtapose that with the, um, uh, the lunar lander here on the right. Um, that top part of that lunar lander will take off. It's, it's a much, much smaller, uh, given the gravitational differences, uh, you need much less energy to escape uh, the gravitational pull of the moon versus the Earth. Now, weight matters too, because that Saturn V costs a lot of money. Um, the space shuttle program costs a lot of money. Uh, what Elon Musk is now doing, though, is he's, he's cutting the cost of getting humans and satellites into space making space actually much, much more affordable. Um, so that opens up a whole host of positives and negatives. Um, but in terms of thrust, so on the right, you'll see this, this is a SpaceX's um, uh, Falcon rocket. Uh, it weighs as much as two Boeing 787 uh, Dreamliners on the left there, but it produces uh, about uh, the thrust potential of about, um, I think, 12 of those uh, 787 Dreamliners. Mm -hmm. So weighs a little more, but the amount of thrust that is required to get to space is just tremendous. And, and, that, and that just requires money. Um, much of space, however, is really just dominated by satellites. So as, 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 as sexy as uh, rockets are and things like that, uh, it's satellites. And that's where most of the money in space is. Um, and you have various, various orbits here, low Earth orbit, which is up to 2,000 kilometers, all the way up to geosynchronous orbit, which is up to 36 kilometers uh, uh, in, into space. And if we look at the number of active satellites now from 1957 mm -hmm. to 2021, you can see the surge here. 
Now, much of this is due to communication satellites from um, SpaceX, uh, from OneWeb, and some from some other companies. So more and more communication satellites are being put into space, but you can see that super spike of, of satellites. Mm -hmm. So who's putting these satellites into space? Well, from the European perspective, Arian Space was formed in 1980. Uh, and this company operating primarily in, out of South America and French Guyana has put um, almost a thousand satellites into space. Its competitor in the United States has had been and still ha is uh, to some degree, the United Launch Alliance, which is a coalition between Boeing and Lockheed Martin. But they can't compete against SpaceX. And I'll get into that in a moment. But when we talk about the satellites in space and there is roughly around 5,000 now or so, um, we're dealing primarily with commercial satellites, military satellites, military non-government satellites, uh, I'm sorry, non-military government satellites. So in other words, like NOAA um, weather satellites and things like that, uh, and civilian uh, and you know collegiate satellites and things like that. Um, most satellites do weigh about you know over 2,000 pounds or 1,000 uh, kilograms. Newer satellites, however, weigh less than two pounds. Um, and if you think about your cell phone, the, the amount of processing power and the weight of your cell phone, you know, technology is just enabling us to cut down the weight, but get much more processing power and more electronics, you know, for, you know, for the weight. Um, if you like pie graphs, I've got four of them. So <laughs> um, when we look at the orbital distribution of satellites, the pri primarily they are located in low Earth orbit, 84%. Uh, and the next biggest there is geosynchronous at 12%, and that would be our GPS satellites. Um, active satellites by country, the United States is about 70%. Now that number is probably going up because Elon Musk is putting, you know, 100 or so satellites every rocket launch into space. So um, as he builds out his communications network, the United States is getting a larger piece. China, number two, is rapidly uh, starting to catch up. Satellites by purpose, 64% uh, are communication satellites. Uh, Earth observation is 21%. Um, and Earth observation are, you know, satellites that can look at, you know, heat on the Earth or, or kind of any kind of mapping and things like that. Active satellites by end user, 72% are commercial, only 11% are government, uh, and 11% are military. One of, the, one of the big drivers of these satellites is, is really the explosion in data. And you know, if you think about data that's being created today, every time you get on an aircraft at Portland Jetport, um, as that jet is taking off and getting ready and then finally is in flight, those engines are being monitored. So if they're general electric engines, uh, there's, there's a circuitry on there and, and communications equipment that can communicate the heat, the speed, you know, everything, uh, the pressure of those engines. Um, and that's important because it helps the, the airline, uh, Delta or United and so on and so forth, determine what the service intervals of that piece of equipment will be, uh, whether or not that equipment's being stressed. So that's just jet engines. You can imagine every time you walk around with your cell phone, you're being geolocated. So if I walk outside my door, data is being created. So we are just creating data constantly. Um, and the amount of data created being created is really just, uh, it's hard to comprehend. So, so what is this space 2.0, we'll call it, the new space renaissance? It's this post-shuttle renaissance, I think. And it's being driven, driven primarily by these factors here. Launch costs have come down tremendously. It is just much cheaper to put a human or a satellite in space. Um, Vertical integration. Um, SpaceX has been able to vertically integrate much of the construction of its own rockets. So about 70% of their rockets are built by SpaceX, which means they don't have to pay higher prices to have componentry made, made elsewhere. So vertical integrations help. Satellite costs have come down and satellite weight has come down. So the electronic circuitry in satellites is cheaper 
smaller and lighter. Uh, so again, if it's all thrust and putting stuff into space, I can put a lot more in space now because the things weigh less. Um, there are a number of new entrants and more capital investment is going into space. Um, private companies, venture capital, um, uh, the defense industry, more money is just going into space right now. But it really comes down to this holy grail moment, I think, which is uh, the SpaceX uh, reusable first stage. So hopefully folks have seen this on, on video or live, but this is the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. And Musk has been able to figure out with his team of scientists how to reuse this thing. And, and if you can reuse it, you can save tens of millions of dollars. Otherwise, this is just trash and scrapped and it's, you know, destroyed. Um, so saving tremendous amount of money. How is this done? Now, Bill might appreciate this as a former Air Force guy, but um, I don't want to get too technical here. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, for the first time, SpaceX was able to utilize all these factors here to the left. Uh, so in other words, when you, when you launch a rocket, and I'll use this pen, hopefully you can see it, um, and, and the first stage breaks off, uh, the, the thrust on that first stage stops, and, and the thrust on the second stage turns on to put the, to put the satellite or the, or the crew capsule into space. Well, it's that first stage that starts tumbling. But what Musk has been able to do is, is create it so that you have a reignitable engine so that that rocket engine has stopped and now it can turn on, um, that you can thrust vector control it. So in other words, the, the nozzle on that uh, rocket engine can move. So that means I can control my descent to some degree. Uh, they have all sorts of thrusters on top of it to push it in the right direction. Um, uh, different navigation systems, uh, deployable landing gear. The bottom line is you figure a pencil goes up and a pencil can land right on its, on its uh, eraser. And it, it's really a feat of physics uh, uh, magic um, in many respects. Um, and it's worth tens and tens of millions of dollars in savings. Um, in fact, he, here, we've, here we go. So you look at the launch cost per kilogram of rockets. So in order to put a one kilogram or 2.2 pounds into space, it costs the space shuttle $54,500. Musk does it now for $1,400. That's the Elon Musk that I want people to know, not Twitter. <laughs> this, this, it's real because this, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're like me and you kind of grew up with Star Trek and Star Wars and you love space and you eventually want to see someone walk on Mars, walk on the moon, put a base on the moon, in other words, um, you know, this is the type of technology that it's going to make that happen. Um, rocket engines too. So not only Musk, but um, Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin. Uh, so Amazon, uh, Amazon's founder, um, are developing uh, very good uh, rocket engines. Uh, <clears throat> you know, for over a decade, the United States really relied on the Russians, and to some degree, we still do for rocket engines. Um, so just think of it, uh, you know, we're buying rocket engines from the Russians and uh, now we aren't now obviously with what's going on, but um, you know, I, I think we can all be proud. We want to see made in the USA. So these rocket engines are being made and designed in the USA now, um, which is, which I think is a, it's a win-win for everyone. Um, space is coming with a lot of these satellites that are being put into space or creating this, what's called affordable broadband service. So for example, uh, folks in Sub-Saharan Africa who don't have any kind of cell service can now have internet service. Um, you know, that's, that's the eventual plan so that you'll get 360 coverage of the globe eventually with, with um, uh, uh, Blue Origin service or with uh, SpaceX's service. Now there is space tourism too. Um, I'm not so hyped up on space tourism. Um, you know, a blue origin here will, you know, put you in this little bubble and they'll put you 55 miles up in the space and you're ready to check for whatever, $300,000. I mean, uh, you know, it is what it is. I, I think, you know, and, and then also uh, Sir Richard Branson with uh, Virgin Atlantic is doing it as well. 
So this will eventually be, be, be big bucks. I, I did listen to a call with, with someone from uh, NASA and they were saying that, you know, I mean, in, in many respects, this is uh, what I'm about to say is very obvious. Space is extremely dangerous, okay? You can't mess up in space. I can drive down the highway and mess up a little and I can course correct. You know, if you have, if you have a, an equipment failure in space, it is serious stuff. Uh, and, and these folks from NASA that I listened to said that, you know, once you, you know, if you, if you have some sort of a spacecraft, a space tourist spacecraft, and, and you have a failure and like say 30 people die on that spacecraft, it probably kills space tourism for a while. Um, it is extremely dangerous stuff, um, which is why it's always really, for the most part, been a domain of the U.S. military. I think a lot of folks in the military uh, with U.S. Air Force and, and other branches have really uh, you know, created most of our astronaut force. You know, in the future, and there are actually companies now working on figuring out how to manufacture and mine in space. So you might ask yourself why? Well, in some respects, I mean, you do have all these asteroids and some asteroids are rich in all sorts of stuff from gold, uh, you know, to, you know, ever, anything that uh, may have a high value. Um, also, I mean, uh, space is a perfect vacuum. It's very cold. So actually there are some manufacturing processes that can be done in space that are actually better. Um, and I was asking one of my engineering friends, well, you know, he, he was all excited about ball bearing construction in space. And I'm like, what's the big deal with the ball bearing? And he's like, well, think of it this way. When you build, when you make a ball bearing on earth, there is a gravitational pull on that ball bearing. And I guess if you, if you can construct a ball bearing in space, you can, in a perfect vacuum, you can almost make a perfectly spherical ball bearing that's just perfect, which means that, you know, in, in various pieces of equipment, you can get much, much longer life expectancy in something that's rotating if you have a, a perfect ball bearing. So that's just one example, but... So space manufacturing and mining, yes, there are companies that are trying to figure out how to monetize or make money from this in, in the future. Um, now, there are folks uh, you know, who use these uh, massive radio telescopes to explore the universe who are a little upset with all of this stuff that's going on in space. So these folks are trying to figure out the origins of space and you know, find new nebula and things like that. Um, but you know, all the satellite traffic now in orbit is causing some communication issues. So uh, this is a, this is going to be an ongoing challenge. But I think if we look at space in these three ways, it's, it is certainly more congested. So we are certainly seeing more uh, satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, you know, we've gone from what, two, uh, maybe 1,000 to 5,000 satellites in the matter of five or 10 years. So it's becoming more congested. It is becoming very, very competitive. Um, you know, uh, SpaceX is just one of many uh, companies building technology to conquer space. Um, and it's going to become more and more contested between the United States and China, uh, first and foremost, but other nations are also uh, competing for uh, a position in space as well. Believe it or not, there are 77 uh, civil space agencies the four largest, NASA, the European Space Agency, the China National Space Agency, and the Russian Space Agency. And the head of the Russian Space Agency, I think two days ago, threatened Elon Musk on Twitter. <laughs> um, so there you go. <laughs> and, <then it's> <laughs> um, and there are four global navigational satellite systems, GPS, which is US space system, Galileo, which is uh, European Union, uh, China has a, a GPS network, and Russia does as well, GLONASS. Now, I was on another call where some national security folks said that the Russian uh, uh, GPS network, GLONASS, uh, many of those satellites are, are, are kind of over their life expectancy. Now, the, the issue there is they can't replace those satellites because right now, given the sanctions and the technology transfer that has been stopped between the United States and um, Russia due to the war in Ukraine, you know, you could have a situation where if one of these uh, GLONASS satellites fails, it can't be replaced right now. 
But the real challenge right now for the United States, I think, is China. China certainly is moving very, very aggressively with its space program. On the bottom here, I've got the picture that the little cutout there is from Time Magazine when the US uh, was, was competing against the Soviet Union for space dominance. And up top is, I, I like propaganda, so <laughs> I like visual, the visual aspects of it. Um, you, you have uh, Chinese propaganda from a few years back uh, when they really started moving forward with their space program. Um, what does this new face of competition look like? Well, on the left with the United States, we have the Artemis Accords, which is now, you know, which, which we're, we're letting in a number of nations, we're letting in Europe and other partners, uh, similar to ISS, the International Space Station, whereby we would like to uh, send manned mission, uh, uh, crewed missions to the moon, land folks on the moon, and eventually build a base on the moon, and then eventually get folks to Mars. So that's kind of the Artemis Accords, which is being led by NASA. China has its own program uh, to land folks on the moon and to um, uh, build a base on the moon. And they have actually been uh, partnered with Russia. So that's what we've got in terms of our, our exploration. We do have the International Space uh, Station, which is the second picture down on the left. But China is rapidly building their space station as well on the right. On the left, the United States has put um, uh, landers on Mars, several landers on Mars. Uh, China has put a lander on Mars as well. And in terms of launch launches, uh, you know, certainly I think the United States still has the most launches, but China's keep really starting to catch up rapidly. Um, in some cases, launching three or four times a week. Um, when we look at uh, space from a military perspective, uh, the budget, the fiscal year 23 budget has about $22 billion allocated towards space. You can see that that's up, well, almost uh, three times from where it was uh, in the early, uh, you know, around 2013, 2014. And in terms of the overall defense budget, in terms of weapon systems, um, uh, space is starting to pick up as well. I don't need to tell Bill this, but I mean, certainly space is one of the five domains of war. I think the newest entrance has been um, land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. So that's what that cyber looking one is. But space is really critical. Um, our weapon systems uh, are, you know, require it. Our communication systems require it. Um, it's just critical on the battlefield. Space Force was formed in 2019. And you know, despite some really um, uh, criticism of it, I think mo most of the folks that I've spoken with in the military actually think that this is a good idea. Um, you know, given the uh, growing importance of space and the competition in space, you know, the Defense Department now can really focus on, uh, you know, their their mission in space. So, I, I think there's been a lot of uh, hope uh, for for the Space Force. When we look at the 1990s and the 2000s, though, if you look to the far left here, 1991, the first Gulf War, that was really the first war where we saw space as a military enabler. We had global positioning systems utilized on the battlefield, communication networks uh, set up via SATCOMs, um, and missile warning systems, missile tracking and guidance systems. Gulf War One, and you know certainly uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, who did an exceptional job, uh, utilized space. That was a real, it's big, big test on the battlefield. Um, 1991 also saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, which I think in some respects cemented our position as the dominant country in space. Uh, 1993, China did form its version of NASA. And in 10 years, they've, they put their first um, astronaut in space. By 2011, the space shuttle program had ended. And for the next nine years, the United States, if in order for us to get folks onto the International Space Station, we had to have those astronauts uh, put into space by the Russians. Now, SpaceX would take over in 2020. And so Musk's company now um, has the contract to put 
US astronauts in space on the International Space Program, uh, International uh, uh, Space Station. There are many, many threats to our satellites in space. Um, cyber threats, directed energy weapons. I have a report today from England on that. Um, China is working on directed various types of directed energy weapons where you could shoot beams up at satellites, track them and, and destroy them. Um, electronic warfare, kinetic energy, whereby you'd use a missile or something like that. Um, all sorts of threats to these uh, space-based assets. Um, and China is building out its, um, all, anything in red here is China. Uh, China's quickly building out its uh, uh, surveillance network in space. And, and, I, and I think this probably goes without being said, but you know, certainly China has been able to leapfrog uh, many other countries and, and, and gain, you know, I mean, to be able to do what they've done now on Mars with their lander, you know, a lot of that technology was stolen from the United States. Um, so they are becoming more and more an adversary to this nation. Uh, they have been for quite some time, but uh, the technology that they're stealing uh, is worth a lot of money. Um, and it's critical to the US economy. So it's estimated that uh, the 24 US GPS satellites, global positioning satellites, alone are worth $70 billion to the US economy annually. Um, so in terms of just, you know, uh, the global positioning of, a, of an aircraft, when you, when you get on an aircraft at the airport and you're flying, that, that is utilizing these networks. Um, you know, uh, you know our, our friends in the Midwest, in terms of uh, the, farm, the farmers now, a lot of their equipment uses satellite, uh, satellite uh, networking in order to uh, do proper crop management and things like that to boost uh, crop yields. Uh, you know, sat, we really rely on satellites for quite a bit. Um, it's estimated that the space industry is worth about $450 billion. Now, in 2019, it was worth $366 billion. And this is a breakdown of 2019, the latest data that I could find. 74% um, of that is in the satellite industry. Um, and you can kind of see the breakdown here, but it, it's, it's, it's quite large. The estimate is that, um, let me see, by 2030, it goes to 1.4 trillion. Uh, so space is big money, becoming big, big money. According to the U.S. Space Force, I have the report on this, um, U.S. satellites are being attacked on a daily basis by China and to a lesser extent, Russia. So how are they doing that? Um, they're, they're doing these reversible attacks on our equipment where they're using lasers and cyber attacks. So it's not physically damaging the equipment but they're testing out various techniques on how to um, uh, you know, put our equipment at risk. Um, one bright point I think for SpaceX was the fact that um, uh, Musk basically at the flip of a switch decided to turn his network over to the Ukrainians uh, in their fight against the Russians. So uh, the uh, Ukraine military had lost satellite communication, which they need on the battlefield as well. Uh, so Musk turned his satellites over to the Ukrainians, at least, and, and allowed them to use uh, that network on the battlefield. Uh, one Air Force report that I read said that <clears throat> the Russians started to jam and hack uh, Elon Musk's network, uh, space network, so that the Ukrainians couldn't use it. And within less than one day, SpaceX was, was able to counter that attack, um, which, which really is exceptional. The Pentagon was uh, flabbergasted by the speed at which the engineers at SpaceX were able to you know, get those satellites back in, in the war. Um, we have what's called anti-satellite tests. So the United States has conducted a few of these. India has conducted some, I think one. Uh, Russia has conducted some, and China has conducted some as well. President Biden in April uh, noted that uh, he would make a unilateral commitment not to test any more of these uh, anti-satellite tests. 
You can see here from the numbers that uh, the test by China in 2007 created 2,087 trackable pieces of debris in space. So, um, you know, everybody's flexing their muscles in space, but the problem is you're creating a lot of debris, which makes space dangerous. It makes it dangerous for our astronauts uh, and European astronauts and Russian astronauts and Chinese astronauts um, on, on various space, space platforms. So here you've got a, a little picture of, of all this space, uh, space junk in low Earth orbit, 27,000 pieces are, tra are tracked by the Department of Defense Space Surveillance Network. But according to the European Space Agency, there's many, many more pieces of debris, over 130 million pieces of space junk. Now, some of it's very small, one millimeter, but you got to consider this too. Um, even, even a piece of paint in space traveling in orbit at 17,000 miles per hour, a piece of paint, I guess it was, struck the space shuttle's windshield and left a big chip in it. Um, and the question is, had it been much bigger, you know, or, or, or just a little piece of metal, it could have, you know, penetrated the, the space shuttle's window. So space junk is a, is a, is a big problem, I think, in the future. Um, which leads us to our one physics term for the day, <laughs> the Kessler effect. So basically what you've got here is an image of, you know, it's kind of an artist rendering of all this satellite traffic in space. And the theory here is that at some point, if there is a collision between two satellites or two space, spacecraft, they, they create debris and that debris hits other stuff and this debris hits other stuff. And eventually you have a cascading of debris smashing into stuff, making, making low earth orbit virtually unusable. That's kind of the theory here. Um, there are many different ways to destroy a satellite. I've learned this. Um, so one great thing about this country, I guess, maybe not. You can learn a lot from the Department of Defense's uh, websites, but... Um, One interesting thing about space you don't hear much about is uh, DARPA, which is which is a military agency which is credited really with creating or helping to create the internet. I mean, these folks do some really cutting edge stuff. Um, they have a contract out now for a nuclear engine uh, based spacecraft. Uh, so why would you need this? Um, well, uh, if we were to ever combat someone in space, perhaps, you, you need a vehicle where, you know, you don't need a fuel source, you have a nuclear engine and you can just really run on unlimited fuel. So that spacecraft could, you know, fight another spacecraft, follow another spacecraft, track another spacecraft around the moon and back and so on and so forth without any need for new fuel. Um, it could also be used for deep space exploration. Um, uh, Musk wants to do it with, you know, uh, uh, liquid propellants for the most part to get folks to the to Mars and back. Uh, but if you think about the future, the real future in terms of, you know, way out, uh, what about if we want to explore past Jupiter or Saturn, things like that? Well, you're going to need it. You're going to need a propulsion system that produces a lot of power, speed, uh, because speed will be the, the you know, <laughs> we can't be out in space for years traveling. So you want to cut down the travel time. Um, uh, so nuclear is, there is a big contract out right now for nuclear power space. The problem here, folks, is you're basically, if I can use my little pen again, and I've got a, I've got a spacecraft in here with a nuclear engine, basically a nuclear reactor, <laughs> and I'm, it's in Cape Canaveral, it better not have a launch incident, right? That's, that's the problem, you know? How do you launch it with 100% safety? And not have a and not have a, a you know a catastrophic event a tra catastrophic event at takeoff, that's the challenge I think. But um, NASA, uh, we'll just kind of go quickly now. Uh, NASA, um, this is NASA's budget. So this 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 kind of tells you why we did how we did what we did. Um, so John F. Kennedy uh, lays out this target of getting folks on the moon. Um, you know, we spent for several years a little over 4% of our federal budget on NASA. 
So, so it took money uh, and, and focus in order to, in order to achieve that, uh, that goal. Today, we spend uh, uh, right around 0.5%. So we spend much less now. NASA's future right now is called the Artemis Program. This is the program that will get that, that, that over the next few years, hopefully, uh, we'll see folks land on the moon um, and, and in longer term on Mars. In order to put folks on the moon, it's estimated to cost $93 billion. So this is a big, big ticket item. It will be done in stages. So the first spacecraft uh, will actually uh, go into space. It will go around the moon and come back without humans in it. And then the next, the next one will have humans in it. So, I mean, it, it's, it's typical NASA. It's gonna, it's gonna be very, very, very safe. And very, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, redundancies built built into it. Um, now, I'll I'll just point this part out. So, once NASA gets gets a spacecraft in in lunar orbit, it's going to meet up with this. They've given the contract to to Elon Musk and SpaceX. This craft will. We'll dock with this craft, and this craft will actually land on the moon with the astronauts. So this is a major collaboration with SpaceX. I mean, if you can pull it off, it will be just amazing. Um, a vertical landing and, and so on and so forth. Lots of things about geopolitics in space, future war. Um, Hypersonic missiles, we can talk about it all, but um, hypersonic missiles are probably things you've heard of, but they travel more than five times the speed of sound. Some kind of get very, very close to space, but certainly all of these things, if you're gonna stop them, are gonna have to be tracked by space-based assets. So um, now the United States does have um, uh, Boeing's X-37B. This is almost like a mini space shuttle. It's un uncrewed, so there are no humans in this. It's uh, you know uh, controlled from Earth, um, and this uh, so this is spent uh, over 500 days in Earth orbit, um, doing doing all sorts of secret things. So this is like very very uh, classified type type stuff. Um. For friend. If for, for folks who really love, like I, I folks, any, everyone know what the SR-71 spy plane was? I know Bill does. Um, it's my favorite aircraft ever. That was retired. That was our primary spacecraft, uh, uh, um, high speed uh, aircraft. This is the rumor that Lockheed Martin Skunk Works is working on the son of Blackbird, the SR-72. Why is this important? Um, it would be able to basically fly from, uh, uh, you know, New York to uh, Beijing in less than an hour and deploy a weapon. I mean, you know, this this is this is the future. Um, and the question is, can we all survive this? Um, oh, why don't I end on a really dis? Okay, so. <laughs> Folks, it all comes down to China. Um, if you haven't seen this book, Destined for War. Um, so these, these are, this, this is the idea where the United States, can the United States and China avoid war? Can we? Uh, history says no. Each one of these moments in history shows where you had a ruling power and the ruling power right now is the United States and a rising power. The rising power is the People's Republic of China. Are we gonna butt heads? Are we gonna play nice? Uh, I have my own views on that. Um, China has just made inroads in the Solomon Islands. Uh, there's a lot going on, you know? And, and the question is, it's going on on many different theaters. It's going on land, space, you name it. Uh, So I think, you know, 
Elon Musk, in a sense, with SpaceX and the folks at SpaceX have actually helped the US military quite a bit. They're, they're, they're able to put more satellites, more spy satellites into space at a much, much lower cost. So he's, he's helping us in the space race, I think, at this point. Um, but I think that is all I had in terms of the prepared stuff. Um, Allison, do we want to open this up to? Um, yes, let's open this right up for questions. Um, hang on a second. Got to figure out how to turn my video back on. You're more depressing this time, John. <laughs> it looks like uh, Bill has his hand, uh, lots of hands up. So we'll, we'll start with Dory and then Bill and then uh, Bob Ashton and I see you, V. So Dory, go ahead. Okay, so I'm wondering about all the space junk and all the satellites Musk plans to, you know, for the Starlink and Bezos, I guess, too. I mean, how there's going to be a whole net of little satellites up there trying to provide the internet. Is that true or, or not, not so much? No, it's true. There's going to be thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, and it's going to have to be a carefully orchestrated dance because I think there have been some near misses in space. With, with some of those satellites. Now, I think Musk and Bezos have both said that once one of those satellites is pa past its usable life, they can basically just put it right into the atmosphere and it will burn up. So I think you know that's their hope there, but there is the risk of a collision, no doubt, no doubt. Thank you. Yeah. Bill Oops. Hall. Bill Hall. All right, Bill Hall is not there. So Bob, Bob Ashton, go ahead. Bill, you can't put your hand up and not show up. Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Can we be friends if I express skepticism in man's spaceflight? Skepticism. Express your skepticism, Bob. <laughs> I don't think it's worth it. If you want to learn something about Mars, send a robot, send 10 robots, send 100 robots. It's a lot less expensive and dangerous than sending a person. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, look, I think that's fair. I think I, th there are folks, there are folks in the Space Administration that believe that you get a lot more bang for your buck with robotics and things like that in, in doing exploration. But I think we're, at, we're, we're kind of in an interesting time where you have a person like Musk, you have a person like Bezos. I mean, Musk is worth 200 plus billion dollars. If he wants to put some of his capital towards putting humans on Mars, I, you know, it may be worth it. Now, now NASA is putting some money towards it, but I don't think, you know, that's not part of the program at this point. Um, but we do learn a lot from space too. I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, Bill, you, you can chime in too, because I think, look, part of the human experience is we like to challenge ourselves, right? I mean, there, there are folks that climb Mount Everest, there are folks that, that do this stuff. I mean, I think as, I think as, as humans, we wanna see people back on the moon. I mean, folks I speak with wanna see an American back on the moon. Um, and NASA has planned to put an American woman on the moon, an American of color on the, person of color on the moon. Um, so, so I think, you know, there, 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 there's all that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, there are definitely people, Bob, that believe that, you know, a lot of this should just be done with robots and robotics and things, and you can, you can do a lot more, but. I was at a lecture that Elon Musk gave, you no, know, 15 years ago, in which we, he said we had to go to the moon and then Mars because we're going to have to abandon Earth and we're going to have to go to another star. And that's, uh, I think he's smarter than that. He knows that's not going to happen. It's really, really far. And you're, <laughs> it's just totally impractical. But but, but that aside, uh, okay, I just think it's, course, if, if Elon wants to do it, that's fine. Uh, but I think we shouldn't put our, 
uh, all our money in that direction. I think the risk is though, the Chinese will put a base on the moon and the Chinese, if I were the Chinese and I, they know better than I, cause they're them, but I would use that moon base as, as, as a military occupation base. And I'd use it to target US satellites uh, that, are, that are circling the earth. So they've got the ultimate high ground. So you're gonna have to put US military folks on the moon, I'm sorry, you know, cause the Chinese are going to. The moon That's, is one thing, Mars is another, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's gonna, it's fascinating stuff, but I wish we could all just get along. But, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean well, yeah. the US and the Chinese, not you and me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bill, it was your turn. We skipped over you, but you can go back to you there. Okay. Well, listen, I've already got my orders for the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to report on Sunday. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's really, I mean, you're the really, I just really enjoyed your presentation, John. I thought this was fantastic. And while you're talking, I'm writing down all of the different stories that could come out of, if you just start with space, there are a million stories that you can go from there. You can go to the economy, you can go to the military, you can go to politics, you can go to the great moonshot that Kennedy put us on and the impact that had on the country, the Soviet US competition, Chinese US competition. This takes you everywhere. You can explore every aspect of this military, social, technological, whatever you want. And I just think that's fascinating. So I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, the other one, the, just a little comment I would make about the military side of it. I remember working in intelligence trying to figure out what the Soviets were up to. And we used to fly U-2s over Russia, over the Soviet Union at a very high altitude, which we thought was safe enough so that they wouldn't be shot down. Well, one finally was shot down. 1960, and Gary Powers was the pilot. And I can remember what, um, uh, and, and I, I, was in the, I was in the Strategic Air Command trying to figure out what Soviet anti-ballistic missile systems looked like, mm -hmm. where they were and what they could do. And when we went when we developed a space intelligence capability, it expanded our access to that weapon system hugely. We didn't have to worry about actually flying overhead with a manned aircraft, right, to take pictures. We could do everything from space. And I remember when we launched rockets with the KH-7 satellite, the KH-7 had a film camera on it, flew over the Soviet Union, took pictures, drop the canister and a C-130 aircraft would retrieve the canister, which was coming down from outer space, literally on a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would run in and develop the pictures. And, uh, you know, this is a long time ago now, but it was really the boon to intelligence was huge. Mm -hmm. And when it really became important to us, I think almost more than anything was when the Soviet Union and the United States agreed to limit nuclear weapons and in anti-ballistic missile systems. Mm -hmm. Because for the very first time, we could actually track the compliance of the Soviets with that international agreement. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about, you know, you want to make your mission peace, well, that truly was an example of the military working for peace. Because we could tell what the Soviets were up to in ways that we couldn't tell before. And we knew indeed that they were complying with the agreement. And that was very important to maintain that agreement. Mm -hmm. A B is next. Um, thank you so much, John. This really is a fascinating, eye-opening presentation. Um, I'm interested in space mining. It seems as if so many um, metals and um, uh, are in short supply or in the wrong countries and countries that with whom we don't want to cooperate too closely. Um, what is the prospect? for successful mining in space? Are some of the um, metals that are so rare here um, abundant on the moon or Mars or asteroids or uh, do we know yet? We do. I mean, there are a number of asteroids that have been targeted now for, for mining if, if, it, if we get to that point. The question is you need to do it in a safe and cost-effective manner. Um, I mean, I think one of the challenges here is I think, you know, look, 
in my view, I mean, you know, wh whether or not you believe in climate change or not, I think we all want we all want a cleaner planet. That's kind of the way I look at it. And in order to do that, if we want electric vehicles, it's going to be one of the major ways to do it. Lithium mining is just it's dirty. The question is, can we get those materials from asteroids in a, in a safe manner and bring them down to Earth without hurting the planet? You know, what I mean, like so. So maybe there are various applications like that. Um, but yeah, the, no, no, the, 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 you know, they're even they, I, look these. <laughs> I wasn't a science major. I was a, I'm an economics guy, <laughs> um, yeah. but God, God bless these STEM folks because um, they have already figured out ways that you can actually use, use the moon and use Mars to, to build, to make fuels. Um, Amazing. Like, it's like, so like Musk has a plan to when, once he lands, you know, his, his spacecraft on Mars, how to actually create the fuel on Mars to get back and, you know, um, so I think the sky's the limit, if you will, in, in some respects, but it's going to cost a lot. And there's going to, you know, I, the, I'll, I'll leave you with this one other thought, like the folks that are talking about like gold and all that stuff on, on, on uh, asteroids. There's one problem with this theory right now. Let's say you have what, what, I don't know how much the total gold supply is on the earth, but I think it's like a swimming pool full or a two or whatever that, you know, what happens if I find an entire asteroid with a lot of gold? It means that the price of gold is going to go. <laughs> so you know, th there's a lot to consider here. But yeah, I think in terms of rare earth minerals and uh, you know lithium and, and other things like that, it, it could be bene beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I think Tim Wells was next, right? right? Yes, Tim. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the, what concerns me most is that uh, Elon Musk and, and uh, uh, um, Bezos have done great things. I mean, it's amazing what they've done, but, but there's the question of, you know, why NASA couldn't have done it to me. Um, I understand some of the issues, um, you know, quite well, but the, I, I, it, 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 we're, we're giving great power to certain individuals. <laughs> and so I don't know what our agreements are, but we're funding a lot of this research. And of course they're on this, they're standing on the shoulders of NASA. Yes. Um, and yeah. And so who owns this and do we have, does our government have the right to utilize it no matter what uh, one, is one issue um, because we've, the, we taxpayers have paid for most of it. Um, and then two, we don't, it, what are the, how do we know what's going up into space and what the capabilities really are? And so can Bezos and Musk, um, Facebook is also doing it. Uh, so these guys can monitor just like our SPAI agencies, they can become as powerful as countries, more powerful than 99% of countries <laughs> and, yeah. and rival the US, China, Russia, and Europe. Um, and this is how do we monitor what's actually going on? I mean, can you imagine if they can monitor countries and, and and they can understand what's happening and, and what our government regulatory agencies are considering um, or what our judicial system is considering. And, and I mean, this is very, I mean, we're going towards like between cybersecurity, cryptocurrency, we're moving towards city states run by mm -hmm. oligarchs versus countries. Mm -hmm. And it's a very scary thing to consider. Uh, of, course, uh, and of course, on the good side, the other thing we haven't talked about much is the, is the that we need these satellites to combat global warming. Mm. They're telling us an immense amount of data on that piece, on that side. No, no, Tim, I, I think you raise a lot of excellent points and I agree with you. So first off, I think one, one of the neat things about SpaceX was how, how have they been able to do some of the things NASA hasn't been able to do because it's privately funded and, 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 and they allow failure. So, so for example, if you're in NASA, I mean, let's face it, folks, it's the government bureaucracy. If I'm head of like the Mars program and, you know, um, Bill's in charge of the moon program and Bob's in charge of this program, I don't want to fail because if I fail, I'm going to get fired. 
SpaceX has a much, much different view on things. They've sent these rockets up, they bring them down and they've cra they cra they crash. Every time they crashed, it wasn't a major disappointment. They learned from it. That is why Musk has described his, the, the, their ability to like uh, harness that technology was through failures. Um, failures aren't really something you get in the government sphere. You get it in the private sector because folks, folks have a timeline. Musk had a very short timeline. I got to figure this technology out. In order to figure it out, fail, 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 succeed, boom. I've solved that problem. Um, now he had the capital and he had the, he had the freedom to do that. Um, but, but Tim, I agree with you. I, I think that it, it, to me, in some respects, it, it does remind me of cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency is the wild west. It has been unregulated by the government. And I think there's a monster out there right now. Um, and, and the government needs to figure out how to control it. Um, and in some respects, they need to control space. I think space, you know, this might offend some folks, but at the end of the day, space needs to be the domain, at least from the United States standpoint of the US military. It has to, the first and foremost uh, consideration has to be US national security. Um, yes. Not, 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 not sending folks into space, you know, who can spend a billion dollars to go for a, you know, a, a riot around the moon. No, it is for the security of this nation. Period, um, folks. I got to tell you, I'm involved in a lot of different things. You don't know what China's doing. You got to pick a side because there is a massive race with China right now. It's 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 not good. It's not. And good. China outlawed crypto. Huh. Yep. Yeah. I see Jim Landau shaking his head like this, and so I want to. <laughs> And he's had his hand out. So I want to give him and then we'll go, yeah, and the associates too. So go ahead, Jim, and then Karen and John. Well, my wife just told me I'm not allowed to uh, give my comment for which I was saying. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, there's, if, you know, if people are <laughs> going to buy terrified. crypto because they don't like the federal government, the federal government should not protect them. Let them go take it themselves. But my question has to do Great presentation, and I would stay up later to see all the slides you didn't show us. Um, but every time we say Musk did this and Musk did that, I have no idea if this guy is a raving genius or we're just using that as uh, a substitute for the organization behind him. And I don't know if I can wait for Isaacson's book to come out on Musk to find the answer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put a stake in the ground and say. Genius. I've watched dozens and dozens of hours of him. I, I okay, uh, hey Jim, go to the Everyday Astronaut and watch watch three hours of Elon Musk giving a tour to the Everyday Astronaut on YouTube. And then you read the comment section. The comment section is amazing. Musk basically takes this guy who's, who's a very, very popular YouTuber, makes a lot of money on YouTube, but is a very smart guy in his own right, takes him around the, uh, 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 the uh, starship where the starship's being built, shows him all the processes and things like that. Musk has the ability to talk about aeronautics, astrophysics, chemicals, manufacturing. Um, but when you read the comments section, you'll see like you folks will say like, uh, I'm an engineer at Lockheed Martin, and this guy knows his f in astrophysics. Uh, I'm an engineer at Tesla, uh, at uh, you know whatever, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, he knows his stuff, and you know, I, I think he he does deserve credit at least for reducing the cost of space. Now, as Tim pointed out, look, at the end of the day, this is all on the shoulders of NASA and the government. The government funded most of these technologies. They, they, you know, Musk wouldn't be where he is today in space if it hadn't been for what the U.S. government did with space. Um, so yeah, and I and Tim said it perfectly. He he's standing on the shoulders of NASA, and he is. And and, and you know, um, I, I do think it begs the question though: How do we control this? Because it is starting to be concerning to me. Um, you know, we're sending celebrities into space. We're sending all, I mean, it's just becoming like a circus. And it really shouldn't be a circus, in my opinion, because the Chinese are building a space station and that will have uh, People's Liberation Army uh, 
uh, astronauts on it. Um, this is serious stuff, um, but it almost seems like a circus sideshow to most of the world, you know? I don't think the Pentagon views it that way, but. John and Karen. Um, are we muted? No. Well, I think, um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was, it was so well done, really appreciated. And I'm, I think my uh, comments are a uh, little, little uh, a few 50 years too late probably, but when uh, we, we were in Antarctica not too many years ago, and what impressed me about that is how years ago Antarctica was, uh, the treaty was made so that there's only, only can be peaceful use of Antarctica. Was that ever talked about for space? Or again, we're way out of the bag for that now, I guess, but was that ever something that happened? Yes, no, the space treaty and the moon treaty call for the peaceful use of space, but I think that's being challenged, you know, or will be challenged. Um, Russia has already, you know, been tracking our satellites with other spacecraft. Um, so I think things are happening in space. And according to the Space Force, I mean, China in particular is targeting our satellites and attacking them. Mm -hmm. So now, the, the, the treaties don't mean anything then that were agreed to at some point? Yeah, I mean, all I, I, I keep telling people, look at the South China Sea. I mean, CNN discovered it, I guess, seven, eight years ago. It was going on before then. Um, China has completely taken over the South China Sea. They broke an international law of the sea rules and so on and so forth. And uh, they basically said, no, we haven't. So what? Um, when you're when you're a big bully like you know the China or the United States, so what, you know, and, and I think, unfortunately, that's where we're going to be. Dory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. This, this is a great presentation, and I really enjoyed it. I just wish you were more of an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> I hate this stuff about, I, I, it's true. I'm not, I'm not disputing it. You're absolutely right. It's just depressing yeah. as hell. No, no, I, look, I, I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm inspired by the, th the thought that we can get back to the moon and eventually Mars. That's what, that's what I'm happy about. I'm inspired by, um, but, I, but I really am concerned. I mean, if we want to delve into China, I mean, I mean, you know, are we going to turn a blind eye to what happened in Hong Kong? Are we gonna turn a blind eye to what's happened in the South China Sea, East China Sea? How about the Solomon Islands? What about what's happening in Sri Lanka now? Um, what about Belt and Road Initiative? Um, what about the Uyghurs? Um, what about the constant surveillance state? Uh, what about videos on the internet of the Chinese authorities um, uh, beating dogs to death with pipes? You know, um, you know, this year Xi Jinping is going to just get his what his third term in office and probably be the leader for life. Um, and he's he's backed himself into a corner with a zero COVID policy because if he backs away from that now, according to a report that came out of Shanghai University today, so I don't know if I can believe it, but 1.6 million Chinese will die if they go if if they remove the zero COVID policy restrictions. He, he, in some respects, is a smarter version of Mao. That is depressing. <laughs> I, I, you know, I studied Chinese history at Bowdoin, so I don't know. I, I, I want to be proven wrong. I, I want a leader of China that, that doesn't ruin Hong Kong, that doesn't, you know, build, an, build a naval base in, in eventually in the Solomon Islands. I mean, this and stuff's happening. Taiwan. What about Taiwan? What about Taiwan? I know. You know, will we go to nuclear war again, you know, to save Taiwan? No, it's incredibly challenging. But we won't. I mean, won't. right. I mean, isn't that part of the point that you're making, John, is that in the majority of these areas, we, yes, we, are we going to turn a blind eye to Hong Kong? Yes. Are we going to turn a blind eye to the Uyghurs? Yes. Are we going to turn up? I mean, consistently right down the road. And we've been turning a blind eye to everything that they've been doing in space and in cyberspace to a certain extent. I mean, that you may have privy to, to discussions that show that there's more going on than it looks like on the surface, but that's part of the fundamental challenge. We yeah, have and I, and I, yeah, and I, and I think in this, in this world of like massive inflation, I think what concerns us is that you know, look, globalization was great in some respects, right? I mean, prices came down. 
Um, now manufacturing jobs were shipped overseas, but now we're paying for that because you know we're seeing national security, the national security implications of not being able to produce rare earth minerals in this country, or you know, uh, you know, uh, high end semiconductors in this country. Um, so, so I think the theory is that instead of deglobalization, you'll have what's called regionalization, where the United States and Europe, the United States and you know Australia, so on and so forth, will work together. You know, certainly Canada, Mexico, um, but can China be a trusted partner in the future? I think you know that it's looking kind of scary with the current leadership. Bill. Bill Hall? I, uh, I, I want to inject a little note of uh, maybe pleasanter <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> it's interesting the impact that space has on the travelers, the people who actually go up and look at the earth from another perspective. Either they're looking at it from very high altitude or they're looking at it from the moon. And isn't that, isn't that a fascinating way to look at the earth? You look at this planet with this little tiny shell of protection, which is our atmosphere, right? And the electronic world around that atmosphere. And you think, wow, what an, we need to live here together. And this is a fragile environment. And especially when you get farther away and you look at Earth in the blackness of space, that is truly mind bending, I think. Yeah. And I think we've, we've achieved that for some people, at least through space travel. And I'm hoping that, you know, if you know, those people will bring that message back, that what a, what a fragile but wonderful place we live that you can see when you're not, you know, right down here in Maine, for example, but you're way up. And the other thing I hope is that we can somehow convert those images that we've seen into some kind of a powerful presentation about the earth and about our environment and the responsibility we all have to take care of it. No, it's a very good point, Bill. And I think, you know, when, when, when you do listen to a lot of these folks that have been to space for the first time, it, it is a bit of a life-changing or, you know, experience in the sense that, you know, it, it's supposed to just be magical to see the, the earth from space. I mean, I'll never do it, but. <laughs> of course, one might say that the people that have gone to space are uh, using an enormous amount of energy and polluting an enormous, putting an awful lot of junk in the space in order to do that. And that's totally antithetical to uh, our objectives. So, and as by the time you have, uh, I hate to be a doom and gloomer, and I, I think I'll just shut up because I am all the time. <laughs> World's coming to an end, and thank goodness I'm old and I'm going to go away very soon. You don't have to worry about me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> other other comments? I mean, I, I got to say that uh, oh. Bob has Bob has brought us back down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> Is that is that good? <laughs> That's your job, Bob. That's why we bring you along. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, that's, that's it is sort of the way I look at it. That yeah. people, yeah. Let, let's if we want to learn. Well, yes. Okay, I've been there. Uh, if you want to learn something, what's the cheapest way to do it? Going there isn't, in my view. Uh, and I've argued with people from NASA on that. I had a discussion at a lecture by the then director of research at NASA. I don't remember his name now, uh, but I went up to him and I said something to the effect, I hope we can be friends if, if, if I don't approve of manned space flight. And it was though I'd hit him in the stomach. <laughs> he didn't want to hear that from anybody, but uh, I think somebody has to say that. Anyway, it was a fantastic test. I'm a space buff, John. And <laughs> I'm a, 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 I taught astronomy at the local college here. Not very well, but I taught some people. <laughs> and I you taught, you taught astronomy and don't want me, me, folks in space? 
<laughs> yeah, well, I want to look at it. I don't want to go there. <laughs> that's very different. Uh, get, I'm a sailor. That's what I'll. That's enough risk for me. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Well, the laws of the sea and the laws of our space are. I mean, well, we have laws of space, but the sea is a very good parallel, right? I mean, same sort of challenge. Sure. Yeah. If you want to get away from it all, well, that's a good place to go. I mean, you don't spend a lot of money and get in other people's way. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we haven't touched on in this in this conversation, John, that we got into a little bit last time was, you know, this this privatization of the research. And, and all of that, which I think is an interesting angle. Um, the implications of so much of the research and development not being owned by the government or driven by the government. And I mean, it has its positives as you pointed out, but I think it's worth noting the downside. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a challenge. I mean, right now the, the government's benefiting from lower costs of space, but um, you know, I, I will say it, it is amazing that even companies like Lockheed Martin and Boeing, which historically have been two of our space pioneering, you know, you know, defense industrial complex companies, if you will, um, have really taken a back seat to this kind of upstart in Texas, yeah. well, California and Texas. So, um, Tim Wells, do you want to? Continue? Yeah, well, that's it, it's you know one of my uh, disappointments with uh, the traditional defense contractors is that you know we're getting a four hundred fifty billion dollar military for the great price of seven hundred fifty billion. <laughs> um, our our defense contractors are extremely extremely inefficient. Um, because they're incented not to be, they make more money by being inefficient. So they are inefficient <laughs> and, um, the system has to be, has to be changed. Um, and it's gonna, it's putting us, it, it is over the long term. China's outpacing us. First of all, again, they stand on our shoulders too, because they've stolen all of our technology. Right. <laughs> so, but, but, but at the same time on the new stuff, they're outpacing us. I mean, yeah. Uh, North Korea has a hypersonic missile before we do. I mean, this is scary stuff. Um, yeah. And that should not be happening. And they're doing it for one thousandth of the cost. Um, and uh, that is pointing to a much larger issue for us um, that we've got to fix. And that, so the one thing that, that, um, this Elon, through thinking differently, um, you know, I know about the risk taking. I, I read a lot about this too. And I just, I, one, I think our government has to fix this problem about risk taking. Mm -hmm. We have to find the right people. It's really about people and culture, mm -hmm. is what it's about. And there's no reason why it can't, why NASA couldn't do it. it but it is that they do have this huge inertia to, to, to change, to fix. But um, but maybe this will help us uh, get, uh, you know, a $450 billion military for $450 billion <laughs> and, uh, and, and fix some. And because, again, the, the, it's not just the money. I mean, that one, that's sapping our resources. But two, we're just moving slower. We're moving slower. They're outpacing us now technology-wise. Yeah. Jim and Janet. Yeah, I just had a question, uh, John, for you. How does this work between the private companies like SpaceX and Boeing and whatever, and, and NASA? Um, is NASA coming up with these questions that they want to solve or direction they want to go and saying to SpaceX and Boeing here, create this for us? Or is SpaceX saying, here's what we could do, NASA, what do you think, and come fund me? Or is SpaceX saying, hell with everybody, we're just gonna go do this? Well, it's a little of both. I mean, it's an excellent question, but I mean, we, we do have the United States government and NASA still driving major exploration programs. I mean, NASA is doing this major program now where 
they're sending, they're going to be sending a, uh, a satellite that will crash into an asteroid. And the, the theory there is for the planetary defense system. And I think the Chinese are going to be doing this too. Can you affect the direction uh, of that asteroid by hitting it in a kinetic way? So they're going to be testing that. They certainly have the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, which is almost near full operation. That is a tremendously expensive and amazing project that, that I mean, it's supposed to be one of the greatest like Hubble times a thousand type things, um, a feat of a wonder. Um, and now with the Artemis program, I mean, NASA is back to, you know, trying to put someone back on the moon. So NASA is leading a lot of this. And, and what they do is they, they farm some of this out, certainly to subcontractors. So SpaceX won the contract to put folks from lunar orbit onto the moon and back to lunar orbit. Um, you know, that crew capsule was, um, I think, awarded to Lockheed Martin. Uh, and then the European Space Agency is building a part of it. So we are, we are partnering with NASA and the European Space Agency. But yeah, SpaceX and Bezos and uh, Virgin Galactic, they are also doing things on their own. And I think this gets to what Tim was mentioning. Um, it's a bit like the Wild West. Uh, you know, you too, if you had, you know, billions and billions of dollars could potentially start putting stuff in space. And it's in many respects, just completely unregulated. Um, you know, now here to four, we've got, you know, we, we kind of know what's happening and I suspect there could be significant restrictions put on these companies if they were doing things that the government didn't like, but, um, so, so I guess it's a combination of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for this informative, somewhat disturbing, but important um, overview of the challenges and opportunities in space. Um, and, you know, for, for sharing all of this with us and for putting up with Bob Ashton, which we all have to do <laughs> on a regular basis, right? Good for you, Allison. <laughs> Um, we have next week our final Great Decisions session of 2022. Um, Ambassador Judith Fergan will be with us to discuss the Quad Alliance, which I think will pick up on some of these themes we've touched on tonight with China, which, um, you know, John, I agree, it's something that I don't think we pay enough attention to and has in incredible um, implications for our future and the future of the planet. So I hope to see all of you next Tuesday, same time, same Zoom link, um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Great, John. Thank you. Good night.